Good morning. Good to see all of you. I have a, uh, a question for you, historical kind of question. How did the pharaohs get the people to build their monuments? It was a pyramid scheme. It was a pyramid scheme. That's how they did it. Didn't know that, did you, Jeff? No, did not know that. Well, we're glad you're here today to gather for worship beautiful thing, the body of Christ assembled. It's a wonderful thing. A couple of announcements. We have uh, coats uh, for a cause, the coat drive, sponsored by Cake, and the boxes are going to be in the narthex through February the 4th. Wednesday night at the Hill started last week. We have a number of wonderful classes. I was just visiting with Neil in between. Some excellent classes have already started. You are welcome to join them. Just you can you can see uh, in the bulletin some of those classes if you'd like to still sign up. You just tear off slips within the bulletin and put those in the offering baskets. So, those are our announcements. I think we should sing. Rayvon, let's do it. Father, we thank you that you brought each of us safely to this place. We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship. As we gather, we remember those who are not with us today. For those who are sick, we ask for healing. For those who are away from us, we ask for your blessing to be upon them. We invite your beautiful Holy Spirit to move freely among us. Come dwell in each of our hearts. Equip us, challenge us, Comfort us, teach us, inspire us as we learn more about your majestic ways. Father, as we gather together, may we behold your beauty and encounter your grace. We ask all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, Jim. It's great to be in the presence of our God this morning whose love and grace is big enough for each and every one of us. So let's lift our voices this morning and sing.
Well, in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we're going to sing what I have been told is one of his favorite songs. Take my heart, take my, sorry. Precious Lord, take my hand. Here we go. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. I am weak. I am weak. I am born. Through the storm. From the Gospel of John. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the, water, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us break bread. 
together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh, oh, have mercy on me. Thank you, choir. Well, good morning, Chapel Hillers. I have to speak really quickly today because at 12 noon is a very special event. Do any of you know what's happening at noon? The Shockers. Only one of you knew that. But I realize my clicker is back here, so I'm wasting time. Thank you, Dr. J. It was a great throw. It all depends on the throw, doesn't it? Well, we're so glad that you're here this morning, and we're talking about weddings today in January. Is that odd or what? It is a bit odd. For some of you, you're aware that we're in the Gospel of Luke in this year, but every once in a while, the lectionary, the assigned readings take us to writings or Stories from John, and that's the case today. How many of you, I don't want you to share them today for the sake of time, but how many of you have a funny story of something that happened at a wedding? Maybe your own. <laughs> I want to hear your stories. I have my own compilation. A pastor friend of mine said that he was doing a wedding and he doesn't do a lot of weddings, and he was particularly nervous. So during the exchange of rings, he said first to the husband, please repeat after me. I give you this ring as a sign of my vow, da-da-da-da-da, right? And then the pastor said, would you please place the ring? What do you think he said? should be finger. He said, would you put the ring on her dinger? <laughs> now I get red even telling you that here. <laughs> and then it went downhill from there. We all have our stories, right? 
Some of you are thinking I'm being a bit too sacrilegious in the sanctuary, but I'm thankful that God has a sense of humor. Isn't that right, Stan? God, may the words of my mouth and may the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight because you and you alone are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. So, here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to take you through three three things. The last two are going to be together, but I want you to know something about Jewish weddings in the first century because this story makes more sense in light of Jewish culture and tradition. The second thing is we're reading from the Gospel of John, and John's Gospel is very artistic, it's very creative, it's very poignant, it's very deep. He is an amazing gospel writer, and there's layers of meaning. And if we want to know what it means for our everyday lives, we've got to dig deep into those layers because that's where the message is to be found. So let's talk about Jewish wedding traditions for just a moment. And for those of you watching online, we're thankful for you. But I'm not covering all of the traditions, so if I miss a few... It's not because I've forgotten them. It's because I don't have time to get into them. But I want to give you just a few. The first is this. When a father and a mother had a daughter born to their family, the very day of the daughter's birth, the father began to stash wine in the wine cellar. The very first day. And the reason is that the bride's father was to provide all the wine, all the food for all the guests, which was a complete village, for seven full days. So the day of the wedding was the first day and then six others. And nobody, it wasn't a come and go, nobody left. It was you were there for seven solid days. Are you still with me? Every wedding then, and it's still true today with minor exceptions, every wedding was held on a Tuesday. So when John's gospel begins on the third day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. The reception would start after the wedding on that Tuesday and go for the next six days. And... Nobody left. Now that's an important part of this story. But there was a tent. Now I've already made my face turn red, so it's going to happen again. If you were married and you were all together for seven full days, that means there was not a honeymoon. So after the rite of marriage... Just like in Montana, where I was born and raised, when there was a reception, people would clink the glass, and what would the couple do? Stand up and kiss. In the first century, somebody would stand up, and the couple would go to a tent outside of the reception place. Now, I'm not going to tell you what happened in that tent, That's for you to figure out. (laughs) But during the reception and in the days to come, every once in a while somebody would stand and the couple would go to the tent and then they would come back. That was part of the Jewish tradition. Now, what does that mean in light of what John is trying to illustrate? Look at the screens with me, please. This is really important. John, in particular, takes ordinary human events and uses these human events that are very ordinary to demonstrate the first of seven signs about the extraordinary kingdom of God. Now, you will often hear Dr. J and the other pastors, Pastor Jen and Pastor Jen and I, will often say what is gospel truth that the kingdom of God is available here and now. All we have to do is trust Jesus and enter in, and we experience the abundance of life and love and light and joy and peace 
So you will often hear us say the goal of the Christian life is not just to get people into heaven. The goal of the Christian life is to get people into heaven now or to get heaven into people now is what I should say. Get heaven into people now so that we can experience the abundance of the kingdom of God today. Now, that's John's umbrella point. It is overshadowing everything that we're going to be looking at today. Now, are you still with me? Okay, so look at this most famous painting. It's the oldest one that exists. It's in the Louvre in Paris. And this shows us what John wants us to get a glimpse of. You will have all kinds of people gathered. There would have been lots more. The painter, I can't say his name, is trying to illustrate that there were lots of people. And if you look a little more closely, there was a lot of music and people brought their pets why? Because if you're gone for seven days, you don't just leave your pets behind. So this was the whole village, humans, animals, anything and everything that you possessed went with you for seven full days. Do you understand now why the father of the bride started stashing wine the day the girl was born? So where is this event taking place? In Cana. Where is Cana? Five miles north and west of Nazareth. I've been there. I love to go there. We've been to the Holy Land three times. The first time I got to go to Cana, the last two we haven't been able to go. I want to go back to Cana. Cana is an incredible city. And what makes it incredible is that you will see this church is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And this is an actual photo, and you will see that the inside, that's a little bit too dark, but it's as beautiful inside as it is out. But you have to schedule like a year in advance for wedding renewal vows or actual weddings, and they're just nonstop. They're continuous. It's called the Wedding Church today. So let's jump into this story as we seek to find meaning for our everyday lives. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding now why does John want us to know that hold on to that and when the wine gave out the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine okay let's go forward in this here's the thing I want you to hear Jesus and Mary working together. John magnifies the role of Mary. Generally speaking, Protestants get nervous about Mary being magnified. Well, guess what? John wants us to know Mary plays a very significant role in Jesus' life and ministry. You can't read the Gospel of John without knowing that Mary is right there next to Jesus. That doesn't mean she's a co-savior. That doesn't mean that she has equal power. It simply means that her influence and her role in Jesus' life is something to be noted. Now let's go back to the story. Look at verse 3. When the wine gave out. What's significant about that? Mary's the first to notice the social faux pas. In first century Jewish tradition, if the wine ran out, the embarrassment that was brought upon the family was not redeemable. It was considered the most significant social faux pas or pick whatever phrase that you want to use to indicate that this family has let the entire village down and it brought shame upon the family not just for the moment or for the seven days but for life. Nobody would ever let you forget the fact that you let the community down. So when the wine gave out the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine. John wants us to know that Mary was the first one to notice that the wine had run out. The wedding party 
in particular the bride's family, was about to be socially disgraced for life. Well, what does that mean for you and for me? There's several things in this story, and I'm just touching on a few. Mary shows us that you always honor the dignity of every human being. And you guard, in the words of that old song, you guard each one's dignity, you save each one's pride. Because she is protecting this family from the social disgrace that would mark them forever as being unworthy of relationship. I don't think we can get a clue, really, because we don't have any idea what that would be like. But imagine if you had the scarlet letter placed upon you because you ran out of wine and nobody ever let you forget it. That's what's going on here. Now, what does that mean for our, your life and mine? Mary teaches us, you always guard each one's dignity. Always. So I was in Dillon's recently. I was standing there in line. It was a long line in front and behind, and there was a woman who had a heaping cart of food. Now, at the risk of being perceived as judging her, that's not my intent. I'm simply wanting to be descriptive. It was obvious that she was going to feed a family and that this food was essential to their well-being. Can I say it that way? She goes to the cash register, the clerk scans all the food, and it's heaping. Gets it all done, and the woman puts in her card, declined. Second card, declined. Third card, declined. The clerk said, do you have any other form of payment? She said, no. One thing I forgot to say at the 930 service is that the woman who was feeling embarrassment watching this go down said, do I have to put all the groceries back? The clerk said, no, but you can't take them with you. There was a man in front of me. He saw what was going down. Without saying a word, he walked up to the card reader, he inserted his card, and he paid for the groceries. And the woman looked at him, and of course she was very grateful and appreciative. And he said something to her, I couldn't hear what it was. He did not draw attention to himself. What did he do? He guarded her dignity. So that's what's happening in this story. And that's something that you and I have the power to do. So one of my heroes of the faith and life is Senator Bob Dole. I pray that we would have politicians who are more like him. Senator Bob Dole, as you know, recently died. And because I so appreciate his work, I listen to every word that was spoken about him at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and then at his service in Russell, Kansas. You may know this. Bob Dole was the one who fought tooth and toenail to make sure that tomorrow, when we celebrate the legacy of Dr. King, he's the one who made that happen. You may know this. There was a battle, and it was likely not to happen. And he was the one. His most famous quote is up on the screen. Why don't you say it with me, if you would, please? No first-class democracy can treat people like second-class citizens. That quote is what moved the Senate to say we must celebrate this day. What's the point? Guard each one's dignity. Save each one's pride. Well, the story goes on. Jesus said to Mary, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Now, most people read that and say, Whoa, Jesus got a little testy. No, no. 
Some people read it and say, this just illustrates that Jesus was putting Mary in her place. She was not going to tell him what to do. No. This is where you have to go deeper. This is where you have to know the custom and culture in which this story took place. Because actually, woman, what concern is that to you and to me is a common Aramaic phrase that everybody within earshot of where Jesus was saying that would have understood what he meant. We don't, because we don't know Aramaic, (laughs) and we don't know all the idioms that go with that. Here's what it means. O mom, my beloved, What is there between us that I can refuse you nothing? See, it's tender. It's loving. It's caring. It's respectful. It's honoring. It's showering her with the most incredibly deep sentiment. I love that. Oh, mom, my beloved, what is there between us that I can refuse you nothing? Do you hear it? And Jesus says, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. What's happening here? Here's the point that John is making. Mary encouraged Jesus to show up and to show out. This is your time. John always wants to show the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus always together but separately and in this instance or in this moment of time Mary is saying to Jesus okay your time has come your ministry is now ready to go to the next level and when Jesus said my hour has not come in his humanity he's saying I know where this is leading I don't know that I want to get involved in this quite yet and she's saying oh yes you do because what did she say to the servants do whatever he tells you. I mean, there was no backing out for Jesus. His mother was, there you go, Jesus. It's time to show up and to show out. And that's a message for you, and that's a message for me. And Chris, I could say this, I could call you by name, each one of you, in this sanctuary. I'm going to start with Chris, but I won't go all the way around the sanctuary. Chris, this is your time. You have your life. You are not to live anybody else's life. Nobody else is exactly like you. You have been uniquely created and gifted for such a time as this. Show up and show out. Now, when I say show up and show out, do you know what I'm talking about? This is your time. Don't waste it. This is your time. Show up. Show out. No matter your age or stage in life. When I was in college, I studied enough sports psychology to be dangerous. If I were to walk into the Wichita State Shockers locker room before their game at noon, I'd say, it's time for you to show up and show out. Be here in your whole being. (laughs) We don't just need a body. We need you. And we not only need you to be fully present, but to show your giftedness. That's what Mary is saying to Jesus. And that's what John is saying to you and to me. How do you know if your mission in life is over? If you're still breathing, it isn't. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I wanted this quote because it so powerfully illustrates what I'm trying to say what led him to show up and show out his mother she taught me that I should feel a sense of what somebodiness but then on the other hand I had to go out and face a system that stared me in the face every day saying you are less than I told Dr. J this at the 930 service. He's a college professor. We need college professors. We value college professors. We're thankful for college professors. But Dr. King was destined to be a college professor. That's what he wanted to do. 
And if you read his writings, he will even admit that he thought oh, it'd be a lot easier, not that it's be easy to be a college professor. But for him, he was thinking, I know where this is going if I show up and show out. And his mother said, this is your time. It may be a mother in your life, it might be a father, it might be somebody else, but I want you in, just, in this moment to think of the person who said, show up and show out. Stop wasting your life. Your life matters. We need you, Peggy, to be you. Imagine what the world would be like if every person showed up and showed out. While that story goes on, I've got to end this. I'm preaching too long. I said I wasn't going to, but I love this story. Hopefully you can tell that. Now standing, there were six stone jars. And what did Jesus do? He fills them with water. Or actually, he instructs them to be filled with water. And so, those of you who are mathematicians, you have six jars. Let's just say that they hold 30. It says 20 to 30. We'll use 30. So six times 30 is what? 180, that's 180 gallons of wine. And how many bottles of wine is that? About 1,000. That's a lot of wine. <laughs> what is John's point? There's a lot of extravagance. There's a lot of lavishness. And wine, biblically, in Jewish tradition, always symbolizes the joy of God. You know that Bible verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Not my joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Every time in Jewish culture that you would get out the wine and raise up a glass of wine, it was your way of saying, God, we're so thankful that you're the most joyful being in the universe. And in this Instance, John is trying to communicate lots of things, one of which is celebration is a spiritual activity. It's important. The first sign of the kingdom of God is what? A celebration. I don't think, generally speaking, that we do this well enough, often enough. We have parties, we have celebrations. But do we really have a celebration around the major events of life that become memorable, unforgettable? Here's another thing, is that the abundance of wine is symbolic of the fact that these jars of purification, they were used to cleanse the people of their sin. Well, once Jesus turned the water into wine, what happened to the jars of purification? They had to be destroyed. They couldn't be used again. What's John trying to communicate? In Christ, the old has passed away. In Christ, the new has come. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. What? significant about that Dr. J will say as a part of the consecration prayer that Jesus is instituting a new covenant a new covenant which means that under the old law we stand in condemnation under the new law of grace and love we have received mercy upon mercy upon mercy and we stand forgiven the old has passed, the new has come. Do you hear it? I'll tell you about the blessing cup another time. Let me close. Johnny Carson, do you ever watch the old shows on YouTube? Am I the only one? At 9.30, I was the only one who has done that. Dr. Hetty, I'm glad I'm not the only one here. They're just hilarious. There's nobody like Johnny Carson, right? Well, Johnny Carson is interviewing Emmanuel Lewis. Emmanuel Lewis was a budding child actor, 
And so he said to Emmanuel, I understand that you go to Sunday school. He said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, did you go last Sunday? Yes, sir, I did. Well, what did you, what did you study? Well, we studied Jesus turning water into wine. And he said, well, what did you learn? He said, well, I think what I learned from that story is that if you have a wedding, you should invite Jesus. <laughs> you know what John's trying to communicate? If you have a wedding, invite Jesus. If you have a funeral, invite Jesus. If you have a life event, invite Jesus. If you have a moment of breath, invite Jesus. And when we invite Jesus into those moments that are on the mountain or in the valley, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. Because how does John end his gospel? Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. They're not all recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing or trusting, you may have life. Zoe, in his name. Join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, as we experience the reality of seasons in our weather, we also see seasons in our lives. And help us to not only see, but to celebrate the beauty of your presence in our seasons. Help us to find you through the beauty of your grace, your power, your peace. Answers to prayer according to your perfect love. Thank you for the people that you've put into our lives to be your instruments of care and encouragement, people who might push us a bit. Thank you for the people who keep us aware of your love. And we also thank you for the hope that is ours in every season. Help us to know that you are always there to meet every need as you have promised that you never leave us nor forsake us no matter what's going on. We need you to minister your healing touch and your special embrace for people that we love and in these moments we lift up to you people who need your presence and care right now. We also lift up to you Don Setchell, Steve Cohen, Todd St. Louis, Pam Sharp, Debbie Adams, Jerry Wilson, Violet Mousseur, Dan Smart, and Kathy Kruger. We ask that you would 
uh, also be near to George Guthrie, who's having surgery, and bring comfort to Rod Hurt, as well as Crystal and Heath Rochester in the death of Barb Hurt. Because you love us and because we love you, we want to bring to you tithes and offerings for your purposes. Bless and use them to multiply the ministries of this church and for the work of your kingdom as we carry out the mission that you've given to each of us and all of us. So we pray, Lord, that you will give us generous hearts and uh, willing spirits as we give to you these tithes and offerings. And for all that you do, we give you praise and celebrate who you are to us our Redeemer, our Savior, the one who longs to be in our celebrations and in our sorrows. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. At the close of the service today, I'll be at the cross, glad to pray with you about any special need that you might have. And just now we invite the ushers to come forward to receive tithes and offerings.
Well, as we prepare for communion, please take out your communion sets, have them ready to go. If you didn't get one on your way and need one, just raise your hand and we'll see if we can provide those for you if you didn't get one. We will be taking communion together. It's one of the nice benefits of doing it this way is that we actually get to take the bread and the cup at the same time. Um, and I'll be instructing you when we do that together. Uh, we do serve an open table. Everyone's welcome to participate. You don't need to be a member of this church or any church to participate. All are welcome to this open table. And Jesus is our host. I invite you now to join me in the prayer known as the Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing everywhere and always to give thanks to you, Almighty God and Abba of all. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We ask, O oh God, that you would make these gifts holy by sending down your Holy Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of Christ. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. I invite all of you now to take the bread and partake together. Body of Christ broken for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you now to participate in the drinking of the cup. The blood of Christ shed for you. And together now we pray as Jesus taught us our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, we give thanks that you have drawn us together as one through this sacred meal. We're so grateful, Lord, that we have this every week as a reminder that we are one, that we are people in whom Christ dwells and delights, and that we are united as your body. For this we give thanks and praise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mark and Kathy, come on up here, please. We are so honored and privileged to receive Kathy and Mark into membership today. And guess what? They're both military, retired, and both pilots. And if you fly Delta, you might see Captain Mark, right? Yes. Out of New York. Thank you, sir, for being here. And it is a privilege and honor to receive you as members. Now, in this new year, we have a new tradition. I love traditions. And I want to tell you just a very quick story. This anointing oil comes from a group of monks on the East Coast. They make this oil out of the recipe that is contained in the Old Testament. It's like 20 different ingredients from all over the world. Then for a month, they pray over it. And then they send it to us once a year. And our congregational care team got together and we prayed over it. And these little vials have been created as a way for us to anoint you today, to ask God to bless you abundantly, lavishly, and then to give this to you. And in the moments when life is good, you get it out and you give God praise. In the moments when life is hard, you get it out and you say, we belong to God. 
He's with us. He's for us. We're not alone. So may I anoint you both? Please. So Kathy, I mark you with the sign of the cross to remind you that you belong to Jesus. And Mark, I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to remind you that you also belong to Jesus. As Dr. J said, Christ lives in us and delights in us. That's an amazing thing. So God, thank you for Kathy and Mark for bringing them to Chapel Hill. We pray that we will be a safe place for them to grow in your knowledge, your love, and your grace. May we be a community that surrounds them with all that is of you so that they might become more beautifully, more poignantly, the gifts that you would show forth in and through their lives to bless this world. Thank you for this sacred moment. We receive them as gifts from you to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Congregation, would you offer applause as your way of saying God bless you and welcome. It is a real joy and privilege to say we're glad you're here. So congregation, would you stand please if you're able? May the grace, the abundant and lavish grace of our Lord Jesus, the abundant and lavish love of God, the Father, and the strength and comfort and even challenge of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing Go With God. Thank you. Go with the wind at your back and the sun.